Hi guys, we've got a great podcast lined up for you. Um, I'm Vinka Manda Anish. I'm the Chief Delivery Officer for T-Hub. And uh, today for the discussion, I've got two amazing gentlemen all over from US. It's your first time in India, I've, first I time presume. In India. And you're having a good time? Great time. Awesome, awesome. So I've got Robert with me. Uh, Robert is the Chief Digital Officer for uh, Broadridge. And Broadridge is doing some amazing work for the past you know, six decades. I mean, uh, yes. maybe even people People thought digital transformation as a theme. Maybe Broadridge has been doing that from before that, right? Yeah, so, uh, Robert, I'd love to know more about you. Sure. Uh, and if you could touch a little more about what Broadridge does, what you do in Broadridge, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Um, so, my name is Rob Krugman. I am our Chief Digital Officer. And that, you know, really focuses on two different aspects. Uh, the first is around digital transformation and thinking about how do we look at challenges and problems that we have internally, our clients have, and think about new ways to do them. How do you take you know, technology, information, and design and make something better than what was there before. And then the natural extension of that is around innovation, where we've created an innovation capability where we can really look to solve problems and challenges that uh, that we have and the industry has. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Uh, also, I have on the conversation today with me is uh, Avid. Uh, we share a common bond, Avid. Both of us yeah, are veterans. <laughs> yeah. So I think that is something that we share common. Avid is a second generation veteran, I'm told. Yeah. So, uh, but Avid, not Beyond that, I think, right? I think uh, you're looking at as a head of innovation for global head of innovation for Broadridge, right? Uh, so could you tell me a little more about that and what do you do in Broadridge and how is Broadridge looking at innovation, so to speak? Sure, sure. Thank you for having us. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. And to your point, first time in India, so that it's been a pleasure so far. Um, yes, as a global head of innovation, you know, Rob and I are actually working very closely together. We uncover opportunities to both feature-proof and disrupt our own business but even more so to help our clients find yeah. ways yeah. to get closer to their clients and customers through the experiences that we provide them and through a set of experiences that we can help them accelerate the growth with. Mm. Uh, within innovation, there are obviously multiple components. It starts with the digital transformation. It goes yeah. into the customer experience. It yeah. goes into research. And we truly believe that you have to both listen and work with the client mm. to really reach a mutual goal, right, of creating something with value in the market. And I think this is kind of primarily our focus, yeah. right, uh, uncovering opportunities and failing fast and delivering valuable, important products in the marketplace. Sure, sure. So, uh, so I would let, tell me something else, right? Do you have any preferences in terms of sectors that you want to work with or uh, if it's not sectors that are verticals, do you have any horizontals that you prefer working with? Uh, deep tech, like Web 3.0, or are you like totally agnostic, you know? Sure, so so we typically serve, I would say, the kind of the broader uh, industry, starting with banks and brokers, going into insurance companies and healthcare providers, but primarily we're serving the broker community. Um, what we're trying to do, and we've done a few experiments, right, to really understand some of the bottlenecks that investors in particular are having in the space. It could be mm. within a type of communications and relationship yeah. that they have with the brokerage firms. It could be uh, in understanding different mm. terminology, mm. accessing information and data, so things of that nature. And what we are trying to do is really kind of streamline the process of yeah. identifying the, the problems, going into rapid research, mm. coming up with different concepts that we can test in market mm. with some of our clients mm. across industries, yeah. and then come up with MVP that we can scale in the marketplace. Mm. Rob, maybe you want to add on that as well? No, I think you hit on it well. I think you know the, the term and the kind of the, the methodology we often think about is design thinking. We want mm. to solve problems from the perspective of our clients, mm. and then more often than not, our clients' clients. Mm. Right? We are a B2B company, and mm. our, our clients serve financial needs of companies and healthcare needs and insurance needs all over the world. And as we think about that, um, you know, we have to think about things from the perspective of that end consumer, mm. right? And how do we actually make their lives easier and better? Because typically when you solve that problem, you solve everything else. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I mean, you know, working your way backwards from what the client wants and then work your way exactly. backwards and then identify the innovation which will help you get there, yeah. right? There's another dimension, if I, if I yeah, yeah, sure, which please, is please. You know, tech enablement. That's mm -hmm. why I call it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think oftentimes, and, and most companies are looking into the type of clients they're having, the type of technology that they currently have on hand, and trying to build use cases based on that. Mm -hmm. What we are taking is a very different approach, right? Mm -hmm. We put the technology aside. We look mm -hmm. at it as an enabler. But we first of all go into the problem, identifying yeah. those problems, prioritizing them, and then figure out what technology can best serve 
the type of solutions we can bring to market. Yeah, yeah. So, so very interestingly, I was having a conversation with somebody else. They said the uh, the innovation itself has changed. Like previously, people used to confuse between innovation and invention. Some people probably still do. But today, innovation is a combination of technologies to reach a solution, yes. right? So somebody were looking, looking at the technology first and say that, okay, I'm going to solve this AI ML, yep. and maybe he might want to have the optimal solution. Exactly. And you right. know that's happening everywhere right now. Right? Absolutely. Gen AI, Gen AI, right? And um, it's, uh, yeah. you know, it, what problems can we actually solve? Let's yeah. not try to find the problem by building something and then figuring out what we can solve. Yeah. Let's work the other way. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes, I mean, like the client or the client's client, don't really care about the technology. They mm. care about solving their problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. How is it impacting them? Exactly. Right. Finally, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Exactly. Right. Consumers care about themselves. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, Robert. I read on your LinkedIn profile. Right. It says, uh, you know, moving from an outsourced provider to a robust cloud-based digital services system. Yeah. Right. Can you just amplify on that? It seems really amazing because I think uh, a lot of people are moving towards that. Yeah. Right. And where do you see your edge? I mean, how what? Where is the frontier there? Where is the edge there which you can, which people are testing out there? So, you know, innovation is a really interesting thing when you work in a large organization, mm. right? It's, it's sometimes a lot easier there's to innovate as a startup yeah. versus innovating as a large corporation. Mm. Now, you can talk to other people who say it's much easier to innovate as a large corporation because you have all of these things that you can build onto. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the keys is how do you take advantage of your network, mm. Mm. right? So when, it, when you think about kind of innovation and, and reimagining things and delivering that. You know, one of the, I think, big opportunities that a lot of companies often miss is we have a thousand plus clients around the world. There's probably much more than that, but we'll use that yeah, as a number. Yeah, yeah. Um, how can we make their lives easier? How can mm. we make their customers' lives easier? Mm. Right, and the, the example I often use um, when I think about this is in the US, uh, up until about March 15th, 2020, mm. Uber, Mm. was driving people all over the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then COVID hit. Yeah. And March 16th, Uber became the largest food delivery company in the United States. True. Their revenue actually went up. Right? So how do you take advantage of that network positioning is mm. such an important thing when you're a large organization. Now, when you're a startup, mm. obviously what you're trying to figure out is how do I build that network? Build how do I get that distribution? Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's partnering with organizations like ours and with others. And, mm. you know, hopefully it's actually, it's such a compelling idea True. that people are coming to you and asking to build. True. Yeah. Yeah. If I can add something yeah. to that, yeah, of I think, and I totally agree yeah. with what Rob said, I think you know it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? There's a large corporation, to Rob's point, you have the network that you can leverage. You already yeah. have an established credibility, mm. right, across industries, among different providers. At the same time, you don't want to jeopardize, right, that yeah. level of credibility. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have to find a way mm. to experiment mm. while you're keeping yeah. Right, yeah. that credibility yeah. level yeah. at the same level right that it was before. And Absolutely. I think that's a real challenge for corporations. Yeah. I think that's why we've created kind of yeah. a separate entity, right, yeah. which yeah. is an innovation lab mm. that allows us to experiment, allows mm. us to engage with our clients, mm. right, without taking advantage or jeopardizing what our core businesses are doing and serving sure. our clients on a daily basis. Well sure. So very interesting because I think to take a leap out of what you were saying, right, I think uh, um, a lot of innovation also, I mean, a lot of our viewers are startup founders, are innovators, right? Uh, so do you think, one is you've set out a separate lab, mm -hmm. right? The second thing is uh, how much of work does Broadridge do for open innovation? Yeah. Like how much are you open to reaching out to innovators out there, startups out there, looking at their solutions or adjacencies to okay. your problem statement. Very, I mean, one of the reasons we're here is very much for that. And one of the reasons we're visiting you guys today is to begin to understand and really tie into the startup community that exists within India. Um, within the United States and the European markets, we actively meet with VC firms on a very, very frequent basis because let's be honest, you know, there's only so much we know. Mm. And that's one of the ways we educate ourselves is to understand what types of fintech organizations, what are, what are the hot things. You go to a, a large conference like Money 2020, for example, and you, yeah, you yeah. simply walk through the exhibit hall just to see what people are talking about. Because likely, that's the stuff that's going to be important in the next two or three years. Yeah. And understanding the potential impact allows us to, you know, potentially stave off disruption, mm -hmm. or more importantly, and I think Aviad hit on this well before, future-proof our business because you mm -hmm. recognize 
we have to be thinking about how do we leverage those capabilities. And yeah. Maybe yeah. some of these companies we should invest in. Maybe some of these companies we become distribution channels. Yeah. Maybe some of these companies let's buy their product. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's also a mechanism, yeah. if I may, right, to educate internally. Right. Yeah. I think so, every yeah. organization, to some extent, right, understand or struggled yeah. by the mm -hmm. notion of change. Mm -hmm. Right. So transformation typically happen on on a corporate level, right? And the innovation happen more when when you build the products, right? Yeah, when you yeah. invest in products and, and platforms. So I think those two go hand in hand. When you expose yourself and open yourself right to the larger community, whether it's VCs, third parties, you enable right the entire organization to see things a bit differently. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. To allow yourself, right, to kind of yeah. Take a bite or, or take a stab in areas in in, in different markets, in different industries, yeah. different type of solutions that you may have not have done okay unless you have that ecosystem around you. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So very interesting. You should mention change, right? Yeah. So because uh, we have a sort of a benchmark guideline for the rate of change, yep. right? So which means that how fast is today's technology losing its relevance, right? If I have to go back and calculate, let's example the half life yeah. of technology, right? So um, a lot of people, and we've talked to a lot of people, and we've come to a sort of an understanding that maybe the half-life of technology today is around eight months. So 16 months, you're one-fourth as relevant, and yep. two years, right. if you're building a product for something which is going to come out in two years later, it's actually one-eighth as relevant as when you yep. started off it is, right? Yep. So I've got, I think, 50 years of experience collectively yep. between both of you all <laughs> yep. in innovation and transformation. Sure. So where do you think that is heading? I mean. Do you think that that is a probable number, uh, or and do you think that number is shortening, or how, what are your views I, on I that? I think one of the questions I kind of go back with, and something to think about, is the hype cycle. Yeah. Right. Like so, for example, like Gen AI right now is in a massive hype cycle. Mm. It's going to go up. Yeah. There's going to yeah. be some type of boom, most likely, yeah. and that's where yeah. the real work starts to happen. Mm -hmm. I think what you're talking about, though, if you think about it from a digital transformation perspective, mm. you're absolutely right. Mm. And when you build new products and services. Architecturally, mm. you have to recognize it is going to change, mm. right? So one of the mistakes large organizations do mm. is they try to think through everything before they actually make a decision to start, Got right? It. Startups never do that. Startups just basically start and they start iterating right away. Yep, yep, um, yep. And how you actually pull in that research and take that market feedback so you can iterate is increasingly very, very important because I can tell you this. If you have a product idea that you're going to deliver in three years, the likelihood of you being right is close to zero. <laughs> it, it just is. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, you have a yeah. product idea that you do in small steps yeah. and you validate and test and market as you're going along the way, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. likelihood of you being correct is much, much higher. It's not 100%, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. There are a lot of good ideas that fall by the wayside. Yeah. The question is, can you fail quickly so that the investments that you're making as you're going through that process mm -hmm. are not as great as you as you would be? And it, that I just, there's one more point is yeah, that yeah. in the startup community, there's so many lessons that can be learned in that because mm -hmm. I have so many friends Mm -hmm. and I, I've been part of many startups in the past, and you know, when to say no more, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. isn't working. Yeah. But yeah. we've learned these things. Let's put it over here. Mm -hmm. I 100% yeah. yeah. agree with yeah. you. I think there's a, another angle to that, right? Which mm -hmm. is it really depends on on the industry itself, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. If you of think course. about heavily regulated industries. Yeah. Like maybe have more maybe pharma, medtech, exactly. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Health, <laughs> healthcare, <laughs> you know, defense, maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. The likelihood for them to both accept and adapt, right, new technology yeah. at mm. the pace that technology is changing mm. is very, very small, yeah. Yeah. right? So the industries are relying more on their consumers, right? Mm. Whether it's retail, right? Yeah. It could be banks, mm. um, hospitality. Mm. They're the ones who are probably going to try to both experiment with new technology mm. and integrate new technology very, very frequently. Mm. They're going to allow themselves to fail, mm. right? Knowing that there's a new technology coming, right? That they can potentially leverage moving forward. Yeah, yeah. The heavily regulated one, probably okay, will stay with the same technology, right? Until it's proven for many, many years, and then yep. change, right? The entire technology stack to accommodate to that. Mm. Yep. Amazing, you should mention it because you you're you're sort of leading me on into my next question again and again. Right? <laughs> I did so, not look at your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if I have to look at it from a differently, right? Yeah. Today's financial institutions, uh, and here I'm starting to move towards the Web 3.0 narrative, sure. right? Today's financial institutions are uh, very robust financial institutions. I mean, they've set their processes over a period of time, yeah. right? And they're very process oriented. Uh, now, Web 3.0 is hoping to change all that, giving a lot more transparency, you know. So where do you think 
how do you think financial institutions will cope up with the Web 3.0 sort of a situation, right? You know? We can talk hours of this. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I'm going to just feed off of what Abhiyad just said. So think about the existing financial institution mm. globally. Mm. I'm, I'm going to leave India out for right now because yeah. your guys' payment system yeah. has floored me as I've walked around and see the way people pay. The yeah. things I am I, excited is not the word from what I've seen. <laughs> but if you think about a global financial system that's built upon banks and brokers that have been here for many years mm. and largely built upon mm. COBOL-based mainframe technology, still, right? The vast majority of finance, back office clearing and settlement mm. and how we move money from one place, how we buy a stock. And You're how saying it's sitting settled. on COBOL? It happens at the end of the day. There's it, end of day all... processes, right? Why are banks open open from nine to five? Yeah. Because the end of day process has to kick off to make sure the system is set up for the next day. So I think if you look at Web3 from two different buckets, mm. right? So one is the technology, mm. one is crypto and digital assets. And yes. you really have to separate the two mm. because from the technology perspective, mm. the opportunity to essentially completely disrupt mm. the way clearing and settlement happens mm. is there. Yeah, it's yeah, there yeah, and yeah. you're starting to see major movements in that direction. You see yeah. JP Morgan Chase um, is redesigning their entire banking infrastructure using mm. Web3 capabilities and an internal coin. Goldman mm. Sachs is doing the same thing. Mm. So there's, there's that piece of it. The, the second piece of Web3 are digital assets and crypto. And we can go into more detail about those, I'm sure, as we kind of go through the conversation. Mm. The third piece, though, which arguably is the most important piece, mm. is the, the self-sovereign component, mm. right? It's the idea that these assets, this, mm. whether they're financial assets, whether they're identity assets, mm. whether they're... Um, physical assets, mm. that you control the ownership of that information and how it gets shared and how it gets used, mm. we're just at the beginning of people thinking about that. And that mm. may actually end up being the biggest disruptor of them all. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I want to add to that as well, because yeah. I agree with Rob. Yeah. We're, we're oftentimes very much yeah. alike. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> if you think about Web3, right? yeah. uh, Web3, in a way, is kind of Web 1.1. It's what it should have right? been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is yeah. going back Yep. into the era where the end consumer or investor or user had a lot more control yeah. right yeah. over their data over how the data is being used very interesting very interesting right? yeah 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 and so web 2 really kind of you know blew up this entire concept right yeah, of a yeah, privacy yeah. of the purpose of your data right how you're using it who is using it who is mm -hmm. accessing it for what purposes things mm -hmm. of that nature mm -hmm. web 3 i think bring back that level of control over your data back to the, the end process user. of it exactly yep. and i think going back to rob's point about the infrastructure the infrastructure is probably the most interesting component yep. right of mm -hmm, web3 mm -hmm, because it's going to enable a lot of services that currently were bounded by regulation yep. mm. in a way i believe and, and rob may agree with me as well regulation going to have to adapt and accommodate right mm. to the movement of web3 yep. mm. because the control is at the hands of the end of the of the user, awesome. right? And the user going to kind of dictate exactly what they want to do with the information, mm -hmm. how they want to transact, right? Who should have access to the information, things of that nature. So I think the infrastructure and the technology here is probably the most exciting um, component from an institutional perspective, mm -hmm. right? From from compass perspective, and then you put aside digital mm -hmm. assets, right, as mm -hmm. an investment, right? That may evolve over time, and you're going to mm. see more consolidation, right, when it comes to cryptos yeah. and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, see, the government sees itself as a custodian yeah. of mm -hmm. the safety of safety, well-being, yep. not only of its uh, of its citizens, but also of its currency, yes. right? And uh, uh, maybe it's, to a certain extent, it's warranted the kind of you know uh, it has. It is very guarded in its approach yep. towards getting regulatory appliances. Uh, where do you see that moving? I mean, do you think governments will you know eventually have to come in, but uh, Timeline wise, do you think that, do you have any idea or, or is it like yeah. too early to be able to say something no, like, absolutely you know, not. It's right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we, we just completed a survey uh, that we released maybe a month ago where we, um, we spoke with about 2000 holders of digital assets, mm -hmm. thousand in the U S 500 in Canada and 500 in the UK. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we selected those markets is in each of those markets, the regulators are starting to think about what rules need to be written as well as elected officials are thinking in that way as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so what we expect is over the next year, you're gonna be see a massive um, movement towards regulation. Mm. That regulation is not only needed, I think the industry is, is begging for it because it's gonna allow the industry to mature. Mm. What's fascinating about it though, is one of the challenges we're seeing, right? Um, 
the financial ecosystem of the world. Mm. There's movement, there's emerging markets become big markets and changes and different things. But the asset classes that are there, we're all familiar with, right? Yeah. There's currency, that sits here. There's, <coughs> you know, equities and securities and those yeah. sit here. And then over here you have commodities. Yeah. One of the challenges I think that um, folks are having a hard time getting their hands around is that in a digital asset space, that's a use case, mm. right? So Ethereum, is this Ethereum an investment? Is it a currency? Is it a utility? Is it a commodity? Well, yes, yes, and yes. And the reason mm. why mm. is mm. I could buy Ethereum and hold it in my pocket mm. and be using it as an investment because I think it's gonna grow. Yeah. I could buy Ethereum because I wanna send you $10,000 and yeah. I wanna actually avoid having to pay very large bank fees to actually do that. Mm. Or I could buy Ethereum because I'm actually building a business yeah. and I'm gonna use Ethereum to pay for the pay actual for access to the blockchain. Mm. So it's, I think what it is, it's, and I don't wanna say it's purely education, part of it's education um, and financial literacy, but part of it is, is teaching folks how to think about things a little bit differently than what we've done before. Mm. And so what's likely to come out of this is a few, I'm gonna use future proofing instead of disrupting. Mm -hmm. A future proofing of financial regulation mm. um, and a rethinking because these assets are going to continue to grow and whether mm. you again mm. whether it's crypto or not mm. you're going to have tokenized securities mm. you're going to have the tokenization of physical assets like real estate mm. these are going to be things that people are actually using and thinking about and mm. so our tax laws our the securities laws or our commercial commodity laws they're all going to have to evolve to think through this mm. and the biggest difference that we see here mm. so broader to the public company yeah. We are registered in the United States and mm. we trade in the New York Stock Exchange, mm. which means we're governed by the SEC. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So a, a security in India trades on an exchange in India and is, is regulated by the Indian security regulator. Mm. Mm. Let's look at Bitcoin or Ethereum mm. or really any crypto asset. Right? Ethereum may trade on 500 different exchanges globally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not domiciled anywhere. Yeah. Right? So. The way we think about regulation and how we evolve this um, becomes really important. And then, frankly, this is an area that's very, very true to what we do. Mm. And we're working with the industry, we're working with regulators to begin to define how do you actually ensure that you're protecting consumers mm. so they know what they're actually buying, but at the same time, you're not stopping innovation from happening, right? And that's the challenge. It's a, it's a challenge, but I think if we go back in time, not 25 years, mm. This was exactly the same challenge we had with the internet, yeah, web yeah, 1.0. Yeah. And one of the more interesting things that happened in the United States is the Republicans and Democrats got together, this is when Bill Clinton was president, and said, listen, this is what we're gonna do with the internet. We're gonna make sure innovation flourishes, we're not gonna pass any rules that stops the innovation from happening, but we are gonna pass rules to make sure we at least are protecting people. Protect. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I, I have um, a slightly different perspective as sure. well on that. I think there are two dimensions to, to that Web3 movement. One, I believe that the, the term global is mm. getting a whole new meaning yeah. <laughs> within Web3. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, and that goes back to kind of the foundational pieces of Web3, which yeah. is yeah. accessibility, mm. control, mm. and speed, yeah. mm. right? And I think those three components gonna force, mm. right, in a way, Hard regulation, up to become much more accommodating, mm. right, yeah. to what the consumer would want. Mm. Now, the global piece of that, mm. to Rob's point, right, is the fact that there's no different markets mm. in Web3. Yeah. Mm. It's one big market, right, mm. where people can transact, they can yeah. communicate, mm. they can share, mm. whether it's information, right, and, and they still feel protected, mm. right? And I feel, when we talk about all about other use cases, right, when yeah. it comes to Web3, right, the insurance, Mm. industry as a whole. Mm, mm, mm. There's going to be some level of, of, yeah. of innovation and disruption there. Yeah. Healthcare, right? Uh, the identity. True. As yeah. a, your identity and the attitude yeah, 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 that yeah, you yeah, have yeah, and yeah. how it's being shared, all of that going to have to be kind of looked at in a very, very different way. And, and for yeah. us at Broadbridge, yeah. right, we are, we are kind of at the core right now of figuring out all those pieces together. Yeah. Because mm. we're seeding across 5,000 brands across mm. different yeah. mm. industries, mm. right? So we have to think about all the use cases, yeah. right? From an investor perspective, from, from yeah. a consumer perspective, how it's being affected, right? How it's affecting them, how it's affecting the regulation, yeah. and so forth. That sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think essentially Broadridge is working across the entire spectrum of Web 3.0, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but moving beyond cryptocurrency, right? Let's look at, for example, something like traceability, mm -hmm. right? Web 3.0 for traceability or smart contracts, decentralized applications, right? 
Now, these are the integral parts of Web 3.0, right? How can businesses today effectively adopt these technologies into their operations? Yeah. Right? Or if you can just give me any use cases or any sample use cases that you've seen of businesses who have successfully very uh, adopted this at a very fast pace and you know and moved on and which has added substantial value yep. uh, to their business processes. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's a lot of different places we could look. Um, I'll, you you brought up identity, so you go with identity. I'm going to bring up this <laughs> one. I'm going to give this one that we love to talk about. But yeah. I'm going to talk about um, supply chain. Yeah. Right. So you know we're here in India. I know you guys have a huge push to bring manufacturing to this country, and as that begins to happen, you're going to want to ensure that people know where the products were actually created True. and be able to follow that supply chain throughout the entire process and True. understand where the bottlenecks are and what's going on. Right. That's a perfect use case yeah. for blockchain. Yeah. Right. And the ability to say, okay, I just got this thing delivered, mm. this bottle of water. Yeah. How do I know for sure yeah, yeah. the steps yeah. by which it took to get here, right? This mm. is a premium brand of water that I'm drinking. Yeah. And how can I be assured that somewhere in that process, mm. someone needs to take a hose and fill up the bottle, yeah. right? That's a great use case for blockchain. Yeah. Or um, pharmaceutical products. You got you know? it. Uh, storage conditions, right? You know, transmissibility conditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, if you start to think about it, it applies to so many different things. And, you know, one of the ones that my favorite use case here, and from what I understand, this is actually being tested here, which I got really excited about, mm -hmm. is real estate. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about the real estate market, um, and I can speak from my experience in the United States. In the United States, we have this thing called title insurance, mm. which means if I'm buying a home, I have to take out title insurance to make sure that the title for that piece of property is clean. No one else has a claim on it, doesn't actually belong to someone else. And you pay, on average, about $5,000 per closing for title insurance. Wow. Right? So think about that use case on blockchain. Right? So instead, the day I buy my house, I get issued an NFT that mm. I store in custody and put in my digital wallet. I take out a loan that shows up there. There's yeah. taxes that yeah. shows up there yeah. on top. Yeah. Now, tomorrow, I want to sell you my house. Mm. The entire right? stack is available for me. Yeah. And it becomes, that closing becomes a smart contract. Yeah. Right? So instead of, and I, I, I don't know the experience in India, but in the US, they tried to simplify it. Simplified means we actually have to find about a 150 page document, which you have no idea what you're signing as you're going through it. You're like, what does this mean? Sign. What does yeah. this mean? Sign. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine being able to, Go and look at a piece of property, reach an agreement with the actual owner of that piece of property, mm. and in seconds, mm. basically sell it, have each of the people that are on that chain be paid, so the, mor the mortgage gets paid, the tax gets yeah, paid, yeah, and the yeah. rest of that money comes directly to you, and then the NFT gets transferred to the next owner, and then over time, you can see a, a listing of that. That's an awesome use case, a yeah. use case that will save thousands upon thousands of dollars, and from what I understand, this is a big problem in India, and yeah. they're actually working on this as a potential yeah, solution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Rob gave a great example around proof of ownership, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Which kind of spills into identity as well. Yep. Correct. The other use case can be around healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Each and yeah. one of us have our healthcare records, right? Mm -hmm. That are kind of an ecosystem, right, of, of healthcare providers and pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. We don't really know, right, for what purposes the data, right, in our records are being served for. And so, to Rob's point before, right, traceability, right, of those records, and you as a user have, you know, proof of ownership of those. Mm. With the ability, when you go to a specialist, right, or a doctor, um, to transfer that information right on the spot, right, with a drop of an NFT for that purpose, right, can help, right? So we have different use cases we kind of start identifying mm. outside of kind of our bread and butter, which is banks and brokers, yeah, yeah, in healthcare, yeah. and insurers, and under this result. Yeah. I, I do think what's interesting about this one, the identity scheme, because I mean, we could, we've literally could be here for the next four hours. Um, but the identity one is a really interesting one because this is one, you talk about the global nature of this, that's yeah. gonna have to be tailored locally, mm. right? So in India, you guys have an identity scheme where everyone now has a digital identity. Yes. And it's unbelievable what that's been able to do. Yeah. Now, in the United States, there is no way that will ever be able to be implemented. Mm. There is a healthy distrust of the federal government to think the federal government is going to manage all this information. So then you start to talk about self-sovereign. So imagine the healthcare use case that Avia just mentioned, where I have a digital wallet, where all my health records are in there, I go to the doctor, I press a button, and they can see all that information. Mm -hmm. What happens today, and i pretty close to home, my wife's a physician, she gets a call at 2 o'clock in the morning about a patient, she knows nothing about this patient, so yeah. she has to go and run. 
yeah, hundreds yeah. or thousands of dollars worth of tests to figure out what's wrong. Meanwhile, if she immediately had access, oh, she would, yeah, that's yeah, what's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I think, like you said, right? We could talk about this all day. <laughs> I think all of us are passionate about yes. you know Web 3.0 and the, and what the future holds for us in Web 3.0. Uh, but I'm going to put you on a spot here, yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, not only about Web 3.0, uh, about digital digitalization itself, mm -hmm. about technology itself, right? Uh, if our startup founders want to build out solutions for, right? Where do you think which technologies or which problem statements? Uh, two problem statements each, which people can work, themes, uh, not as a problem statement as such, two themes in which you believe that two trends or two themes that they can optimize to build solutions on. Sure. Uh, do you want them to build on crypto or do you want to build them to do you want to build them on transformation? So I think about a few, um, and I've got to kind of combine the two a little bit. The first one um, I would think is experience. I, across all of our lives, mm. we walk into areas where experiences are not as good as they should be, Got right? It. Um, it. And you can apply this to so many different use cases in different mm. areas, mm. and solving for those experiences is not difficult. Mm. Um, and from a startup method, I think one of the challenges, and, and we have this challenge internally, and startups have this challenge, is people like to talk about what they built. Mm. The better way to, in my view, mm. is to tell stories, mm. right? And explain the actual impact what it is that you've developed or you're thinking about developing is gonna have on the individual. Because mm -hmm. it becomes a much more personal connection. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah. I'll give you an example. We recently, and this came through our innovation team and lab, mm -hmm. we created a product that aimed to rethink the way communications happen between brokers, financial service brokers, and their customers. Mm -hmm. Because what we found is that all of this communication was going back and forth mm. simply for the purposes of checking a box that's called regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. So we completely reimagined the experience around the needs of the actual investor themselves and answering the questions that they had. And it's been adopted and it tests so well because it makes a lot of sense, Yeah. right? And so leading with experience is such an important component. I, I think the other, the other aspect of this, um, and I'll, I'll kind of you know, give a, a crypto use case here, is, and I think the application here is for, Web3 crypto payments, right? The payment infrastructure that your government has built is unbelievable. Mm. And so when I look at what's here, the use cases that can be deployed on top of that, and I'm sure there's many people in this building that are thinking through that, are infinite, right? Mm. How do we make it easier to pay bills? How do we make it easier to move money? How do we, you've solved for such a major piece of that infrastructure piece, mm -hmm. and now the question is, what can we put on top of that? And I'll tie to my first point. If you lead with experience and think about how experience can be improved around payments, hmm. you think a lot of solutions are gonna be able to be developed. Yeah. And yeah. to add to that, I think uh, India is, uh, currently the per capita of India is around 2,400 something dollars, right? Uh, and um, even though we have a huge base of population, it is likely to move up to around $4,000 by the turn of this decade, sure. right? Uh, that's almost like a, 70-80% growth, mm -hmm. right? So, like you rightly said, experience, and those kind of people will want with better earning capacity, with better spending power, they would want to look at better experiences. And they should be thinking about financial literacy as it comes to that. We spend a lot of time talking about that because if all of a sudden people are gonna have disposable income that they can use for other things, one of the challenges that we find globally is that the percentage of the population that really understands finances mm -hmm. is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And so you see mistakes that happen, for example, in the stock market because people are just betting. They don't mm -hmm. really know what they're buying and how to actually think about investments. Mm -hmm. And so financial literacy is going to be a huge opportunity in this market. It's a huge opportunity globally to teach people to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Got it. I have a yeah. few of them kind of yeah. to add to that, yeah. and I agree with Rob. I think, you know, I've called relevancy, simplicity, and kind of meet your customer where they, where they need you to yeah. be, right? And I think you guys have created phenomenal payment system here, yeah. right? Where, you know, we were just the other day in Mysore, right? We took a trip, we went on elephants, guess what? We had to pay and we used a QR code. Yeah. That's <laughs> unbelievable to us, right? Yeah. So to me, the simplicity of doing things is a key that has to be replicated yeah. right across the board, not just for payments, right? For other purposes as well and globally. Yeah. And to Rob's point, I agree, um, the terminologies, right? When it comes to financial services, maybe it comes to other, other sectors, has to be very simplistic. So that the end user know that if you're signing on a contract, 
signing on the legal document, right? They have an understanding of what it means to them. Yep. Mm. And I think that's a big challenge, right? The, the example Rob gave before about the title insurance in the United States, you're being asked to sign on 150 pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't even take the time to read that. Yep. I think, okay, mm. if we had a summary, right, of what it means to you as a user, mm. right, as a home buyer, right? Yeah. It would make a lot of sense to you, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, you kind of bring together the simplicity, the relevancy, mm -hmm. the experience, right, which kind of sits on top of that. And mm -hmm. you're meeting the customer where you, they need you to be. Mm -hmm. I think you can create an ecosystem of valuable experiences that will leverage the right technology that can evolve over time and essentially can make businesses much more profitable, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm going to, so just to build off of, because we just were, we just took a tour of T-Works. Yeah, yeah. And one of the uh, people that we met, one of the innovators that we met there, was a 20-year-old who grew up in rural India on a farm. Yeah. And he showed us his pro products. I right. actually want to invest, I want to buy him. It was amazing <laughs> what he did. But he, the simplicity of one yeah. of his products was he watched generations of family members and people who lived in the community lean down to plant seeds. Mm. And he bought a very simple device that you basically just use the device to yeah, plant to the seeds so you don't have to lean yeah, over? Yeah, yeah. That's brilliant, right? Yeah. I think one of the challenges a lot of um, people often make in innovation is they make it overly complicated. It mm -hmm. doesn't need to be overly complicated. Right. Solve the simple problem first, and then you can build other things around it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when I think about this, I, I, kind of, I often go back to Amazon. Amazon, everything they do internally is driven by something called the PRFAQ, Press Release Frequently Asked Questions. Mm -hmm. And you have, to, you have to write this to get approval to spend money. What does the press release do? It has one point, one thing you have to define. Is it solving a customer problem? And if the yeah. answer is yes, you get funding. If it's not, you don't. There's something that can be learned for that. They've done a pretty good job. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys. Yeah. Firstly, I think uh, yeah. at the outset, thank you for visiting India. Uh, I, am, I hope you'll have a great time. I'm sure, like you told me, you're already having a great time. We're coming back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, secondly, thank you for coming forward to Hyderabad. Uh, I think uh, you're spending a couple of days here. Yes. Uh, may you have a great visit. And thirdly, thank you for eva evaluating T Hub. Uh, thank you for visiting us. And uh, thank you for, uh, we have a lot in store for you the rest of the evening. I hope you guys have a great time at T Hub. Thank you for thank having you. us. It's been a pleasure so far. You know, being in India, being obviously at T Hub, we really appreciate the opportunity. I, I think, think we're both, I, fair to say, we're completely blown away. We, I came with no expectations, not just of T Hub, but of India. I wasn't really sure what to expect. <laughs> I am blown away. the 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 warmness of the people of this country is like it's it, it's blown us away. It really has, and the and the food is incredible. <laughs> is it? It's incredible. You know, you know, a lot of people say that it's hot, it's spicy, oh, and stuff. Scared. Like. <laughs> it's like, like it, my plate has never been so colorful in my entire life. It's just great. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad you're having a great time. Uh, thank you so much for coming over. Thanks thank so you so much. much. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.